we kind of have the uh, envious task, I guess, of, of kicking off the uh, two-day summit. And thanks, Michael, for all the hard work that you put into this. This is great. And we're, we're all glad to be here. Um, as Kurt said, I'm Chris Harris. I'm with Colorado River Board of California. And I've got uh, four of my peers and distinguished colleagues up here. And I think part of our role is to help define the landscape about which we're going to be talking and thinking about over the next couple of days. And, I, and looking at the agenda that uh, the group has put together for this symposium, it's really all about connections. It's, it's This panel will kind of talk about connections of the Colorado River to their individual um, uh, stakeholder interests whether it's the Bureau of Reclamation and their role and responsibilities in the state of Arizona, uh, Dan Denham with the San Diego County Water Authority, and then finally we'll kind of drop right into Tina Shields and the Imperial Irrigation District and its very intimate relationship with the Salton Sea and the Colorado River. So uh, with that, what we have are, as I said, my four colleagues, Dan Bunk on the, the left of the table up here, is the Deputy Chief of the Boulder Canyon Operations Office for the Bureau of Reclamation up in Boulder City. And he really helps um, the three lower basin states manage and operate the system that provides Colorado River water to all of us. Tom Bushotsky, uh, next to Dan, is the director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources, and I've worked with Tom for something in excess of 30 years now. And uh, he has uh, about as challenging a job um, managing Col Arizona State in the Colorado River as we do over here in the state of California. Dan is the Assistant General Manager for the San Diego County Water Authority and has been intimately involved in Colorado River programs and activities, particularly those between Imperial Irrigation District and, and San Diego, um, with his entire tenure at the authority. And then finally, Tina Shields is the Water Manager at uh, the Imperial Irrigation District and really knows the nuts and bolts of moving something in excess of 3 million acre feet from the Colorado River into the Imperial Valley. So with that, I think we'll start at the, the large level and have uh, Dan give us an overview of what the Bureau of Reclamation does and its relationship to providing Colorado River water to the stakeholders in the lower basin, uh, the Secretary's authority, and then maybe even give a little bit of uh, uh, law of the Colorado River 101. And then we'll step into Arizona's interests ultimately, and then to Dan, and then finally finish up with Tina. So with that, Dan. Dan Bump, the Deputy Chief of Operations. I have no idea how to get through <laughs> Thanks, Chris, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, again, I'm Dan Bonfair. I work with the Bureau of Reclamation up in Boulder City, Nevada. Um, I've been working on river operations uh, for about 15 years, uh, starting out uh, in the field, and now in this uh, role as a Deputy Chief of the Board Operations Office. Um, today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about an overview of the Colorado River Basin, uh, talk about drought uh, that uh, started in 2000, um, the drought contingency planning process that's going on, and some projected uh, future uh, conditions. Um, yeah, we'll the sure. um, so the uh, the Colorado River Basin, uh, there's 16.5 million acre feet uh, that are an allocated annually, uh, seven and a half million acre feet to each upper and lower basin. And then there's 1.5 million acre feet uh, delivered to Mexico each year. On average, over the last 110 years, uh, there's about 16 million acre feet uh, by inflow into the system. So most of that inflow comes in the up, from the upper basin, about 90% of it, of which about 70% is snowmelt runoff. So we really rely on the snowpack in the upper basin 
uh, for the water supply in the basin. And then there's another million acre feet or so of uh, inflow in the lower basin, primarily in the, the stretch of the river uh, in the Grand Canyon, between Glen Canyon Dam and uh, Lake Mead. Uh, inflows are highly variable from year to year, um, which is why we really relied upon the, the storage in the system. Um, the Colorado River system has about 60 million acre feet of storage. Uh, that's about four times the annual inflow. And that's allowed us to capture water in some of the high flow years and then to use the storage to continue to meet uh, water delivery requirements in the dry years. And um, over the last 20 years, we've only had five above average uh, inflow years. And so we really relied upon this large storage in the basin to help us make water deliveries, not just for water users, but also in the upper basin to help meet some of their um, environmental and their endangered fish. <coughs> Um, operations and water deliveries are governed by the Lava River. Um, among many key components of the Lava River, one, one component is the fact that the, the Secretary of Interior is the water master for the lower Colorado River Basin. Um, that's unique in, in the western U.S. Uh, the, most of the other uh, reservoir systems are uh, managed by the uh, state engineers, and that includes uh, the upper division states, of uh, Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, and Utah. Um, so we play a unique role um, all the way from scheduling water deliveries to creating an annual operating plan each year um, to uh, doing the water counting. Um, we account for 98% of the lower uh, of the lower Colorado River mainstream water use on, on a real-time basis. And that is updated daily on our website. Um, we also administer water contracts. Um, all water users in the lower Colorado River Basin, Mainstone, have a contract with the Secretary of the Interior. And so we administer those contracts. Um, and we also have an extensive uh, real time gauging network as well that we manage. Um, so that's, those are the primary functions of the, uh, the water master. But another thing that we also do is uh, provide technical support uh, for. Um, various initiatives like the development of the 2,700 guidelines, drought contingency planning, and our relationship with Mexico as part of our partnership with Mexico. So, this real, you know, the, the, the real short story of what's been going on in the Colorado River Basin is this red arrow on the chart. Uh, this chart shows the combined storage of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, since Lake Mead initially started filling in the late 1930s, and then Lake Powell started filling in 1963. Um, as I mentioned, we've been in the midst of this 20 year drought starting in 2000. During the first five years of that drought, uh, system storage and the combined storage of Lake Powell and Lake Mead uh, went from essentially full to about half full within five years' time. In particular, Lake Powell went from full to about 35% full within that five year period. And so um, since then, we've had just good enough hydrology as well as some uh, conservation efforts that have been going on uh, that have kept Lake Mead's elevation from getting any lower than it is currently, which is about 1083 right now. Uh, but really, the that five, five year drought uh, the system took a pretty big hit. And then, uh, <coughs> been maintaining since then, um, but the, the but that five-year drought uh, led to the development of what's called the 2007 interim guidelines. Uh, these are guidelines that uh, provide for the coordinated operations of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, they establish a banking mechanism for Lake Mead called potentially created surplus as well as establish uh, guidelines for determining shortages in the lower basin. And this, uh, these guidelines were put in place for about 20 years uh, through, through 2026. Um, the guidelines don't include operational agreements with Mexico's. Those are developed through the International Boundary Water Commission, and they're called minutes. And those minutes are essentially operational agreements that supplement the 1944 water treaty. And so there's Minute, three to th uh, minute 319 was in place from 2012 through 2017, and it has many of these same uh, mechanisms, such as a way for uh, 
Mexico to store conserved water in the US. Um, it's called a potentially created Mexican allocation. Um, and then there's there, Mexico also sh uh, shares in short surplus um, as part of uh, as part of uh, Minute 319 and now uh, uh, as part of Minute 323, which is in place for 2026 and was adopted in 2017. Um, there's other components to the minute as well, which are very important, such as uh, there's environmental uh, components of the minute that's allowing for some water to be delivered to some restoration sites down in the Delta area. Uh, there's projects to help conserve water in Mexico, among other things. So this chart shows the key elevations uh, for Lake Mead. Um, at elevation 1145, uh, that's where there's a surplus condition to start up until uh, we get to about 1129, which is full pool. Um, but at elevation 1075 and lower, that's where the uh, shortage uh, conditions uh, would kick in uh, for uh, the lower basin as well as Mexico. Uh, we're currently at elevation 1083, which is about 39% of capacity. Um, so we've been hovering around just about this 1075 elevation uh, for the last five years or so. So we've been just above it, but the, to date there hasn't been a lower basin shortage. So even with uh, the, uh, the, 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 the benefits that the, um, and our guidelines have uh, provided um, the lake still reached its lake Mead still reached its lowest point in 2016 uh, since the early 1930s, and so the basin states, as well as Reclamation and the Department of Interior, tribes, Mexico, and other uh, stakeholders um, realized that more needs to be done um, in addition to the guidelines in order to help protect uh, Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, so these pictures show uh, Lake Mead's elevation in 2000 when it was essentially full, and then in 2016 when the elevation was about 1075. And that white band that you see on the picture um, in 2016, uh, that white band is about 140 feet in vertical height. So the lake's about 140 feet below full pool. Um, it was then, and it still is today. <coughs> So the drug contingency plan plans are actions that are in addition to the 2007 interim guidelines. Uh, the goals of uh, the, uh, the drug contingency plan or DCP, as you're likely hear throughout the, uh, the conference, um, or at least through parts of the conference, um, are to reduce the risk of uh, Lake Mead and Lake Powell reaching critically low elevations. And we define those low elevations as elevation 1020 at Lake Mead and elevations uh, 3490 and 3525 um, at Lake Powell. And 3490 is very significant at Lake Powell because that's the, uh, the top of the minimum power pool. Um, so essentially, any any elevation below that means that Lake Powell would not be able to continue to produce hydropower. And it would also reduce uh, the amount of water that could be released as well. So the key elements of the drug contingency plan, um, additional contributions of water by the lower basin states. Um, and, and those are done through what we call water savings contributions that are similar to the shortages, except that this water is recoverable if like these elevation were to recover to elevation 1110 or higher. Um, additional flexibility for this water banking, for this water storage and recovery to incentivize conservation. And as we'll see in the next slide, uh, this has already occurred even though the uh, DCP was just adopted in May of this year. As well as drug response operations and demand management program on the upper basin. And the drug operations are a way for the reservoirs upstream of uh, Lake Powell to um, release additional water to help keep Lake Powell above that minimum power pool and to, so that it can maintain both hydropower and to maintain water delivers uh, part of the 1922 compact. So this is, uh, if you can imagine that teacup that showed the, the key elevations uh, for Lake Mead. Uh, this is uh, showing a table that has the DCP, the water savings contributions that are part of the DCP in the US and the 323. So some key components to this is that 
uh, reductions or these water savings contributions, they kick in for Arizona, Nevada, and Mexico higher up in the reservoir. So between elevation 1075 and 1090. California has water savings contributions if Lake Mead's elevation would get below 1045. And then down at elevation 1025 or lower, um, the reduction is essentially double uh, for the combined reductions for the U.S. and Mexico from 625,000 acre feet up to 1.375 million acre feet. So there's been a lot of uh, Actions to date to help bolster Lake Mead's elevation. The line on the top shows the actual end of year elevation. The dashed line on the bottom shows a hypothetical Lake Mead elevation. And um, I'm going to do one more minute. I see my time's up. Um, so through 2018, there was about 2 million acre feet of this stored or conserved water, adding about 26 feet to Lake Mead's elevation. Um, with the DCP in place, um, the lower basin in Mexico will be conserving about 750,000 acre feet of additional water this year, which will add another 90 feet or so. And so, right now, for at the end of 2019, we're projecting Lake Mead's elevation to be about 35 feet higher than it would have been otherwise without these programs in place. And then, lastly, looking out through the end of this interim period for 2026. Um, back in 2007, the chance of pile of weed reaching these critically low elevations was less than 5%. Um, when we did our projections last August without the DCP in place and before the hydrology that we had in 2019, that chance was a, approximately fourfold higher. Um, but now with the DCP in place, uh, which are the two blue bars um, on the right side of the chart, and you can see that that risk of dropping to those critical low elevations on average is uh, above where it was back in 2007. Thanks, Dan. I think we'll hold the question <laughs> for Dan and other panel members until the end, and then we'll give the audience a chance then to uh, bring a few questions to bear. Our next speaker is Tom Shosky, the director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. And he's gonna talk to us about Arizona and the threat shortages. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Chris. So good morning, everyone. I think to start, it's important to note that for Arizona, the Colorado River supplies essentially 40% of all the water used in Arizona. So it's an incredibly important water supply to the state. Again, we heard from Dan about the job contingency plan. We think it's one of the most significant pieces of legislation in Arizona passed in the last 40 years. And it literally was a collaborative effort within our state. And that collaborative effort was important, not just for folks in Arizona, but for all the people <coughs> in the states and in Mexico that rely on the river. So a little bit of a job contingency plan recap. Actually start on the bottom of the slide. Bottom refers to the Colorado Job Contingency Plan between the states. You can see in the photograph the state representatives on the bottom who signed all the documents along with the U.S. representatives on May 20th, standing atop Hoover Dam. And I'll point out that my colleagues and I testified in Congress on March 27th and 28th, and the bills were passed April 8th. That's kind of an unprecedented event that Congress has to do that quickly. But it's reflective of the support we had between all the states and also how important this issue is. In the House subcommittee hearing, California Representative Clintock made an interesting statement. He said it was the first water hearing he's ever been in where the members of that subcommittee and other members outnumbered the Arizona members, outnumbered the California members in that room. It was a very interesting time. So the job community plan. And Dan showed you the numbers already, adds potential reductions to the state of Arizona. And so our stakeholders were uh, wanting to know why and they should take those additional reductions. And your information is helpful with us in explaining the risks of falling levels of Lake Mead and even bigger shortages than what Dan showed on his slide. But we needed to have a public process to build support from our stakeholders to uh, allow the director to sign onto 
all the documents that implemented the Japanese plan as is required by statute. I have the pleasure of being the one representative in all the basin states who actually has to get legislative approval before I can sign on to those kinds of agreements. So we had a about seven or eight month process with a 38 member steering committee that included legislators in the room, leadership from both the House and the Senate and from both parties. And we put together a, a plan that partially mitigated the impacts of these increased increase reductions to our stakeholders in Arizona. And I'll show you how those priorities and those reductions fall on our water users in the subsequent slide. But on January 31st of this year, the legislature did pass that legislation and Governor Ducey signed it. So that top picture is the signing ceremony. And what's important is that that room, that spot is the very place where the 1980 Groundwater Management Act was actually signed. That's how important this draft emergency plan implementation uh, legislation in Arizona was to the elected officials and the stakeholders in our state. Again, the same chart Dan showed you, uh, but pointing out uh, in the highlighted areas what Arizona takes under the 2007 guidelines on the left and the additions on the right, and essentially at the lower levels, adding 240,000 acre feet of reductions on top of. 480,000 acre feet of reductions already agreed to and required by the 2007 guidelines. So, 720,000 acre feet, that's half of the total potential reductions for all the lower basin states and Mexico combined. So, a pretty big nut for the state of Arizona to meet. So, getting into how the, the impacts of the drought emergency plan fall on our water users. On the left, we have the Arizona's Colorado remain stem entitlement, so folks that take water directly off of the river. And you can see the priority system there. Priority four is the lowest priority, the most vulnerable to shortages. That actually includes Central Arizona project water. Then priority two and three and priority one. Those higher priorities are basically our Yuma uh, area agriculture and then some Indian tribes. On the right hand side, then we break this down further into the CHP priority because this is where the shortages are going to actually hit our water users. The priority four users on the river who share an equal priority with CHP are not going to be taking the hits. We anticipate at least the dependency of the plan 2026 because they have not grown into their entitlements and they won't get cut until those entitlements are fully used. Kind of the deal we put together in 2007. Between the CAP water users and the on river users. So, on the right hand column, you see the priorities within CAP. The least, uh, the lowest priority at the top is other excess. This is water that's either stored under the ground for the future or replaces groundwater that's been pumped out within central Arizona. Then we have our agricultural water users who take CAP water. There's a pool of 300,000 acre feet in orange that they have access to uh, then our non Indian agricultural priority water. These days it's neither non Indian or agricultural. Really, it is going to tribes and cities, and this is pursuing as is the ad pool for the 2004 Arizona Water Settlement Act, which settled a couple of tribal water right claims um, using Colorado River water and settled the payment dispute over the CAP between the CAP and the federal government. Then you can see the higher priority will be blue, the Indian priority water, and the municipal and Indian priority water. And then some highest priority water that came out of, out of the Newman area pursuing the prior water settlements, the green band on the bottom. Interesting to note down in the language at the bottom of the slide that Arizona actually has 86 Section 5 contractors. <coughs> Section 5 contractors have contracts with the Secretary of the Interior to actually be able to take water off the river. Uh, we're unique, I think, in that goal of having that many contractors. But again, I am legally able to bind those contractors under state law. Uh, and then, of course, the Central Arizona Project, one of the contractors, moves about half of Arizona's 2.8 million acre feet uh, allocation uh, between 1.4 and 1.6 million feet, uh, acre feet they can move. Uh, more recently, it's been closer to 1.6. 
So a comparison here of how the Dallas County guidelines and the DCP interact. And the slide on the left, you can see under the different shortage levels in 2007, how the other excess pool uh, is gone. But then you can see how the different tiers, 1075, 1050, 1025 elevations and length of impact. Essentially, uh, the ag pool may be a sliver of the NIA, NIA priority pool. But then when we add in the additional reductions pursuing the draft policy plan, you can see early on uh, there's a hit uh, to the ag pool that almost wipes it out entirely. And we start to get into the NIA priority pool at the lower elevations starting at 1075. And so the water users were basically saying to us, we're not expecting what's happening to us on the right hand column. What can you do about it? So the implementation plan essentially found ways to partially mitigate these impacts, and I'll go into that a bit. And it had two main components, a mitigation component that included wet water deliveries to the total maximum of 400,000 acre feet potentially over the life of the plan, again, 2026. Direct payments uh, for the reductions, and money for agriculture, uh, that sort of lose their CAP water so they can increase their groundwater quality. One of the key components of this mitigation program is that in the last three years, the mitigation starts to ramp down. Uh, two of those three years, and in the very last year, there was no mitigation in place. That was a very key component of the plan. And pursuant to an opinion piece written by Governor Ducey in November saying, we have to prepare for a drier future. You, the water users, really need to understand that out of time we can't continue to mitigate your shortage losses. So at the same time, we are trying to prop up the elevation, elevations of Lake Mead to the drought mitigation plan. We're taking water out of the lake for mitigation is 400,000 acre feet. So we put together an offset component to bolster back into the lake that 400,000 acre feet of water. And so through the system conservation program, we actually created uh, uh, surplus program, we were able to put together a plan to, to replace that 400,000 acre feet. And the way we did that is basically with the help of our tribal entities. Tribes in Arizona have about half of the CAP water and about half of Arizona's water in total in terms of their water rights. So the other community along with the U.S. was creating 100,000 acre feet of savings in Lake Mead. The Arizona Water Banking Authority with the Gilbert community, 50,000 acre feet. There's 150,000 acre feet of system conservation being done, 50,000 acre feet of tribal entities, creating surplus and an exchange program between the Central Arizona project and the Salt River project. So again, I'll just finish by saying that the Colorado River is a very important water source in Arizona. Chris mentioned in his opening remarks how we're all connected. And we definitely have learned more about how we are connected as we negotiated the job contingency plan, which actually started in 2013. We are connected from Wyoming all the way down into Mexico. The Salton Sea is definitely a very important part of that connection. I don't mean to be flippant when I say this, but I know which way the prevailing winds uh, blow as well. So Salton Sea, air quality is heading to Arizona most of the year. We have concerns about that. We know how important the Imperial Irrigation District is to be partners with us on the river. They negotiated the job contingency plan with us. Evan Kelly, sitting in the audience, was in that room with us for months. Unfortunately, we weren't able to have Imperial Irrigation District be part of the final plan. There's an on-ramp for them to be out into the future, but we need all the players up and down the river from Mexico up to Wyoming and all the water users to participate if we are going to successfully manage the drier future that we know is coming on the Colorado River. And with that, uh, I'm done with my remarks. Our next speaker is Dan Denham, the assistant. GM of the San Diego County Water Authority, and he's going to speak to the table. Take it away, Dan. Yeah, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> so I, I don't have any um, history of this, <coughs> um, but I was going to speak to uh, a little bit of history um, with regards to the 
USA and State Water Board actions that I think arguably um, are San Diego's or the uh, California chapter, at least, of the uh, law of the Colorado River. Um, just a little bit of uh, background on the Water Authority. Um, we are also a water provider. Uh, we do provide uh, service to um, the residents of San Diego County from Camp Pendleton down in Mexico, about 3 million people. And uh, what we uh, have in the form of our QSA supplies, the Complication Settlement Agreement supplies, represent probably about 50%, just short of 50% of our total regional water supplies. Um, 200,000 of that uh, comes from the uh, conserved water transfer with the Imperial Irrigation District, and then 8,000 acre feet. Um, from the lining, the concrete lining of the All American and Hotel Canal. Um, I think a lot of what I have to say is probably going to tee up most of what Tina has to say about um, QSA and JPA and, and water history. But um, I, I think arguably everything starts with the State Water Resource Control Board. Um, going back to the 70s when the sea was in a much different state. Uh, when things were flooding and, and water was inundating farmland, um, there was action that was uh, required of the district in the valley um, that went to DWR and then eventually went to the State Water Resource Control Board um, in the form of a decision that really, I think, set the stage not only for uh, the quantification settlement agreement, but arguably some of the things that both uh, Tom and Dan talked about with regards to um, how we more efficiently use water in the basin and the quantification of those rights allow for the 2007 uh, guidelines and the programs that in fact help uh, now build elevation in Lake Mead. Um, so in the 70s, um, you, you were at a point where um, through an adjudicatory hearing at the State Water Board, um, it was determined that about uh, 360 or so thousand acre feet worth of water was deemed a reasonable conservation target um, for the Imperial Irrigation District. Um, so with that, the, the district uh, pursued a comprehensive um, conservation program and, and determined that at least initially, um, 100,000 acre feet worth of water could be transferred, um, in this case, to the urban coast, uh, to the Metropolitan Water District. Um, you know, with that um, came funding, and that was very important funding um, for conservation projects in the valley. Um, but I think if you step back um, against the backdrop that I described earlier, it was during a period of, of flooding. And so when you get to um, what, I'll, what I'll talk about in a little bit about the San Diego transfer, and I think the future uh, of, of water conservation, the Ag to Urban Transfers, um, the Salton Sea, um, it was not an afterthought, but it was it was a thought um, viewed through the lens of flooding. And I think that that's very important um, as to how you view the history of the sea and, and, and where it is now out in the future. So you fast forward a little bit um, into the 90s, and um, we're now in a much different environment. This is an environment of drought. Uh, this is uh, an environment where California uh, has an insatiable appetite for water. And it's water that Tom didn't use, and uh, California lawfully used that water. Um, and, and now Arizona and Nevada uh, store that water. And California was in a position um, where it had to live within its means. It was facing pressure uh, from the basin states to conserve water, um, to, to live within its 4.4 million acre foot apportionment. And so you get back to what was that original state water board decision back in, in um, the early 80s with regards to that conservation target that was established. Um, so you start looking to that and, and how much more water could be conserved um, in the valley. And so then you start talking about quantification and additional water transfers. So we got to a point, um, and I'm, I'm going through a lot of um, real fun history here, but um, in the 90s, you know, the, the original transfer was envisioned at 500,000 acre feet between San Diego and Imperial Valley. Uh, that number got down to 300,000 acre feet and eventually 200,000 acre feet with San Diego and Imperial Valley and then 100,000 acre feet with the Coachella Valley Water District and the Imperial Irrigation District. So with that, the San Diego County Water Authority and I, and I in partnership went once again to the State Water Board um, to determine a change in uh, place of use and point of diversion. 
and it was a 15 day hearing. Uh, much of it was, uh, much of it involved water rights, the protection of water rights in California and specifically um, uh, the water districts uh, that would be impacted. But um, the second part of the 15 day hearing, and um, arguably the most controversial, if you can believe that, over the water rights portion was, was the Salton Sea. And, and what do you do with it this time or not? In a situation where you're not in an environment of flooding, but you're in an environment of drought and increased water needs. And so um, the deal was eventually inked only because we had leadership in Sacramento to, um, to, to force legislation that set out a very, very specific parameters with regards to what the water agencies were responsible for in terms of mitigation um, and funding for programs in the Imperial Valley, the Coachella Valley, and at the Salton Sea, and, and what the state agreed to backstop candidly um, with regards to the transfer and going forward. So what came out of that process was QSA enabling legislation that set those parameters in place. It set dollar amounts for, for Imperial Valley, San Diego, and the Coachella Valley Water Districts in the state of California in terms of mitigating the very specific impacts that the transfer causes on the Salton Sea. So I think that that's a very important distinction. Um, and, and by the way, that was, that was tested. Um, in, with 10 years worth of litigation, and it was it was upheld um, in terms of uh, that being a valid structure for the three water agencies and the state. Now, what happens when the when the money runs out, if you will? Um, the state agreed to backstop everything related to additional funding of projects related to um, the water transfer. So it's important to understand that in terms of there's there's the mitigation of the Salton Sea, and then there's a broader public policy objective that, of course, the transfer of the QSA is part of. Um, but the broader public policy objective, I think, for the state and all of us here today, is how do you crack the nut on um, making progress on the sea in totality? Um, so, so going forward, the the QSA JPA um, has. Um, the, the, the three water agencies agreed to um, just short of $400 million worth of, of mitigation funding. And uh, the agencies have been paying into a fund and spending that money on projects, mitigation, and monitoring since 2003. Um, to date, I think the number is, is close to about $150 million that has been spent um, uh, at the Salton Sea. It's important to understand what the JPA is. I think fundamentally, the JPA is, is a bank. Uh, it's a bank that collects money from the water agencies to implement projects that are um, administered by the Imperial Irrigation District. Um, the IID um, sort of sets the plan in terms of the air quality monitoring projects on the ground, and the GPA, which does consist of the three water agencies in the state of California, um, approve a budget that help IID implement or you know fund those programs. So. Fast forward a little bit to um, after, after I think as you all know in this room, there was a period of, of mitigation work going into the Salton Sea. Um, you know, $100 million and 800,000 acres of water that um, it was the transaction between 2003 and 2017. That, the intent of that water was to keep the Salton Sea in a static state, in a pre-QSA, if you will, static state. And that's what essentially um, it did. Um, the equal amount of water going into the sea um, was comparable to what would have been lost through the QSA water transfers. Um, so you get to a point in 2018 where we, uh, many of us in this room, um, began, became very frustrated with progress at the sea. Um, there was a lack of funding out there, so arguably nothing could really be done without funding. You had a small pot of money from the GAPA compared to the larger, in 2007, it was a $9 billion restoration plan. Um, so we got to a point where it took some leadership, and that leadership came um, from the Imperial Irrigation District, who um, filed an order with the State Water Board, a uh, petition um, to uh, to form what is now um, the Salt Sea Management Plan, 
With that stipulated order, the County of Imperial, the San Diego County Water Authority, um, and a number of NGOs, uh, the Pacific Institute, the Sierra Club, Audubon, and Defender joined that stipulated order um, to sort of set in place the future of, of what we hope to accomplish at the Salt and Sea in terms of meaningful mitigation and the restoration aspects of uh, the Salt and Sea Management Plan. So I think going uh, going forward in the future, that should be the roadmap for everything. Um, you know, we, we lack a little bit of progress in the, in the short term. But I say we, the collective we, everyone in this room, um, I think has a stake in the success of the Salt and Sea and getting projects done there. Um, out into the future, I, I don't think that, that it can be ignored, ignored in the context of the basin states. I, I think Tom uh, uh, took some of the words right out of my mouth. Um, I think the Salt Sea has to be given equal dignity um, with some of the projects that are being talked about in the basin and what what could be done um, for the sea that is comparable to what's being done in the other basin states. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. That's great. Tina, you're up. Tina's going to talk to us about the Imperial Irrigation District, the Salt Sea. What are your thoughts? So I have a lot of words on slides. You can read them at a later date or speed read. Um, I'm going to talk through some of them, and some is a little bit different because we're still just to move on and give you history. But just from a perspective standpoint, for those folks that are maybe a little more familiar with the Salt and Sea and not as familiar with the Colorado River, um, IID has an entitlement of 3.1 million acre feet under the terms of the QSA. Um, that's a pretty large entitlement. You can see by the checkerboard pattern on this map that it's the largest single contractor. And outside of the state of Colorado, um, pretty much everybody else uses significantly less water than we do. But how do we use this water? Well, you all are familiar with the area. We live in the desert. Our service area from an acreage in farmable production is about a half million acres. But in total, it's a million acres. It extends out to the sand dunes to the east and to the west. We don't have infrastructure to serve that, but you never know what the future is if for some reason the hydrology would should turn. Um, but that's what we do with the water. We put it to use, we grow food and forage for the nation. We're able to farm year-round, which is very different from a lot of the other areas, and it requires a lot of water to have that um, productivity. So what do we farm? This is just a real short list of the largest crops that we farm. But we pretty much tried everything down there, and unless you're a nut crop or peaches or something that requires a little bit more chill than we have, um, we've either grown it, growing it, or tried to grow it. Um, but really, the forest crops are the staple of, of the ag in our community. And our, our community as a whole um, is economically driven by agriculture. Um, it's a $2 billion industry. If you According to the last crop reports, and it far overshadows from the employment sector um, anything other than you know, communities and county service and, and perhaps you know, government agency schools, kids, and employment children, those types of things. But it is a, a mainstay for our community. Important um, beyond that, from the standpoint of keeping the nation with a secure food supply. So, what's the problem? Uh, I think, as you've heard earlier today, the hydrology hasn't been. Um, in recent years, what it was historically or what it was thought to be when the state was divided up. And in the 90s, there was a challenge with Arizona and uh, Nevada developing supplies and that excess water not being available for California use anymore. So we were told, and you know, in certain terms, it's time to go on a, a water budget diet in California. Well, the challenge with that is the way water rights are um, apportioned within California. So the highest priority water users are the ad users. But you see here under the first, second, and third priorities. And we had a collective water right to 3.85 million acre feet. So Calvary, who's located on the river, has the highest right to use what they use. Then the water goes through the Yuma project. And then IID fight over the balance of that 3.85 million acre feet. With the implementations of the transfers from Metropolitan, it was meant to address some of these issues. 
but not having these defined priorities within the ag agencies made it very difficult to measure transfers because we could conserve a lot of water, but we could still use a lot of water on the other farm acreage. It was in effect. So the water balance wasn't working out after that. So in order to facilitate these ag to urban transfers to solve the water diet problem in California, we had to quantify, that's where the, the quantification settlement agreement name comes from, the ag districts. And we had to give everybody a, buck, a water budget from which to live from and from which to measure that conservation. I, ID ended up with 3.1 million acre feet. Coachella, um, when you do the math, had 330,000 acre feet, but also the benefit of a transfer of 100,000 acre feet from IID as a part of these um, settlement agreements. And then Palo Verde said, hey, we're the senior water users. We don't want to find anything that limits our use. So Metropolitan agreed to backstop um, the calculation, and they were assigned a, a quantified number of 420,000. If they use more water, Metropolitan's on the hook to pay that water back. But to the extent that they use less water, Metropolitan gets the benefit of that. Um, also, at this time, Metropolitan was moving forward with a balance program with Palo Verde, so that helps them manage that commitment as well. But the biggest challenge was uh, Metropolitan has a pipeline that's about a million acre feet and their water right is about half that. So absent having this unused water from Arizona and Nevada, there was a big hole to fill, And that was the QSA and that was the purpose. Um, in total, all of these transfer agreements, I've layered them here on the graph, but they total just under about half a million acre feet of full implementation. We're still in the ramping up years. We've got um, next year's our last really big jump, and then we sort of taper off until about 2027 when we fully implement them. Um, combined with the Metropolitan Program, we'll be transferring in excess of 15% of our water supply. I say transferring, but we only transfer conserved water. Um, that's how things work in, in California, and frankly, from IID's perspective, we want to put that water to use. So the only way we have extra water to spare is to the extent that we can become more efficient and still continue to farm as much as we always have, use less water, and then that water can be made available to other entities. So how does that affect the salt and sea? Well, from a water balance standpoint, and this is a little graphic of IED situation, but the tell is very similar. The water comes in 85 plus miles off the Colorado River. It's a desert. Um, we deliver to about 97% of our uh, water uses for ag purposes. 3% goes to municipal and industry. That's a little different here in the Coachella Valley. But that water goes to grow crops, and then to the extent that there's runoff or leaching to um, help get the salts out of the soil, that excess water discharges into the salt and sea. Um, leaching is very important um, from a Colorado River and an ag perspective because the crops can't grow. There's too much salt in the root zone, and every acre foot of water from the river brings in about a ton of salt. So it's continually leaching. Um, the challenge with the salt sea is that's where the drainage water goes and because it's a confined body of water you have evaporation you have inflows but you have no other blending or opportunity to dilute that water it just concentrates itself over time so how do the transfers affect this and, and how do, how does this come into play um the salt sea has always been a struggle um there was an article in our local paper i think two days ago we have a little 50 years ago today, 40 years ago today, and the 50 years ago today was about the salt and sea and how there was a plan to address the salinity through desal. Only the IID engineers at the time were not real sure if the technology would work, and the numbers were huge. So when you read that article and then you see what we're faced with today, it's the same challenge as 50 years later, and the problem is 50 years worse. Um, but from a water standpoint, um, the salt and sea has always been kind of the rock and the hard place for IID and, and for others in this area as well. Um, when I came to work at the district in the 90s, we had excess water going into the sea and we faced beneficial use challenges from the state board and were ordered to conserve water or find funding partners to help us. Um, at that point, Metropolitan stepped in and funded system conservation. Uh, we were able to uh, save water um, using their funding and improve our system. Um, and that was hopefully to help the salt sea shrink, but that's sort of the opposite problem we got into with droughts and conservation is we went from flooding to the sea receding and having to have responsibilities either way it went. There sort of wasn't a way to just keep it whole. Um, this is just a timeline of the different transfers. I think one of the things I'm trying to make clear when you read all the words and, and get to that point is twice the IID board voted down the QSA 
and it was largely based on concerns about the solvency and how to address and how to fund for those. Um, the Department of Interior, we looked back, we talked about the collaborative process. It was kind of a smackdown back in the day. We were told to do a deal or they would help us, and they did. On December 31st, our board failed to adopt the QSA that everybody else wanted. They adopted their own version, which had the protections for the sea, and the federal government didn't take too kindly to that and issued a little notice cutting our water over by 300,000 acre feet, which coincidentally was the volume of the transfers. IOD sued them in federal court, received an injunction. That put Matt and Coachella in a pickle in 2003 about how to manage that shortage of water. And we went through a process where IOD said, if we're going to sign on to this, we're not asking for these transfers, but somebody needs to take care of the solid sea. And that's where the state had to step in, and, and Dan talked about the leadership. I think the leadership also goes to our board. Um, Violate time here <laughs> for, for interjecting itself and, and calling Bell and not allowing that to happen. So I'm going to talk quickly now. Um, the, the state had a commitment on the QSA. The state obligated itself to the JPA funding. It obligated itself to restoration. Um, it's a huge task. It's super hard to start. IED gave up on a no following requirement in order to help facilitate this and allow for this 15 year planning period where the state was supposed to be figuring it out. But when they didn't do anything um, for quite some time, IED cried foul. And in a, a three year drought in California, when folks were trying to figure out what the heck do you do, um, we filed a petition that essentially threatened to turn off the water to the urban areas if they didn't step up to their responsibility. And it turns out it was effective. The state at that point realized, oh, we have a problem. They moved forward with this task force that identified this near-term plan to address 30,000 acres. The feds got on board, signed an MOU. I don't think we've seen any money from it yet, but you know, they were there in spirit. Um, and that stipulated order was issued. And, and folks, I think, around the basis said, oh, yay, IID's good. Well, we were good for a little while. <laughs> Until you see a little funding shortfall. So that was a little problem for us. I'm going to show a video while I talk so you can see our concerns. But this is a graphic of what happens at the Salton City over the next 45 years due to the transfers. So the dirty little secret on water transfers is you're becoming more efficient, which means you're using less water and you're having less runoff. But all that runoff is coming from the Salton Sea. So you solve your water crisis by being efficient and conserving water and transferring it. But here's the consequential effect, and that's what the salt sea is dead. I think this is really unique for conservation programs in other areas. I think there's there's conservation impacts whatever you do, but the salt sea is sort of the extreme case of what can go bad with water conservation programs and, and unintended impacts. I think we all knew this was going to happen, but really nobody thought about when it actually started happening and how we're going to address it. Um, so we're very appreciative that the state did finally adopt that stipulated order that called out the annual milestones. We've really seen some progress by this current administration to take action. And yet today there's still no projects because we've kind of squandered this 15 year planning period. And boy, that's a heck of a job to try to address and it's a little overwhelming. We've studied the sea to death. Um, we really just need to get out there and start building some things. You know, if they break, what's the worst thing that can happen? You're flooding the salt sea. I mean, you really need to just get out there and see what works and come up with some projects that start to address these air quality. I'm not going to go into our mitigation program. We have some folks talking about that later. We built about 2,000 acres of air quality dust mitigation projects using things we've learned from our farming community. I'm going to go ahead and go real quick to this DCP nexus. Um, IID was very involved in the DCP discussions. We said from day one that the Salton Sea had to be addressed. I'm not sure we knew what addressed meant. We just knew we had to find a solution to the problem. Um, the stipulated order was helpful. Um, in late 2018, the Salton Sea was still a problem, and we realized we were going to have to scale back IID's role, and the DCP accommodated that. Um, but again, no projects were happening. The 2018 milestone was missed. 2019 is not particularly on target. And then in November of last year, the water bomb failed, and that had that gap of funding that would have at least provided a financial assurance that the money was there for when the projects did get built. As a result of that, um, Reclamation felt a need to move forward on the DCP. We have a little different perspective on that. Uh, we were very concerned about um, some provisions in some of the, the legislation that 
uh, we felt could have um, allowed additional environmental impacts to happen without proper accommodations or mitigations. There were some savings clauses inserted in the legislation, which we think were very helpful to the C. Um, there were some funding opportunities in the USDA farm bill changes that we're hoping the state can leverage and access um, so that those projects can move forward. But this, the DCP moved forward. Um, our board approved it. The top interstate agreements that said until we have these South Sea issues resolved, we're where we are and we've drawn our line in the sand. And we're all about making the, sure that the, the, the collective responsible parties, whether it's the state, whether it's the feds, whether it's folks that have a lot of money and want to be generous, but there's definitely a need because we all live here. We have to breathe this air and we have to live adjacent to this resource for the rest of our lives. Um, so maybe other folks can't see it, but our really goal is drawing attention and linking this and frankly moving forward in the, the renegotiation guidelines um, and the discussions about getting back in the DCP. Um, IT has a lot of conservation potential, but until we address the salt and sea impacts and where it's going and until the state of California is able to catch up with those obligations and sort of go big, we are where we are and we'll continue to be in that position. Um, the last two slides is why should the feds care? Because they've been a little resistant to creating fast tracks to money. We're kind of locked in bureaucracy. Well, the feds are the largest landowner at the salt and sea, so there's certainly another responsibility as well hope they take to Harvard and step up to the plate a little bit more than they have been. The state obviously has an obligation, but this is a really big problem. And for water supply, security, and resilience of the future, and the Colorado River ID needs to be a part of that. And we need to be a part of it because we have a lot of potential and a lot of water, um, and that potential creates opportunities for conservation that can benefit anyone. But again, we're not going to be going big on conservation unless somebody else steps up and this big on the salt sea. Thank you, Tina. Well, I think we have some time for a few audience questions. Um, yeah, you remember to turn on your mics too. Come on, feel free. Here is one up there. I understand why we have land checkerboard patterns where the railroads went through the state. Why is there a checkerboard pattern um, at the Salt Sea? How, what's the history behind that? <coughs> I have no idea, but I'm sure somebody does. I don't know what my gather. Urban maybe that I think was it Hoover that designated it as an agricultural sump back in the Coolidge. Coolidge. Well, it's been designated okay. twice by Congress as an agricultural sump. But it's if you have the checkerboard, it probably has to do with the original land grants and And maybe the railroad too. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Up in the back. Um, I know the reclamation man didn't talk about Lake Powell, and I understand that quite a bit of water last winter because we added to Lake Powell. Can you tell us about that and what that's going to do to the level of Lake Mead? Yeah, so Lake Powell, um, as of today, is about 54% uh, full. Um, it did, uh, the elevation did increase by about 40 feet last year. Um, so the, the result of that was is that rather than releasing less water um, in 2019 and potentially even less in 2020, like we're projecting before the runoff started back in January this year, is that Lake Mead's elevation actually ended up over 20 feet higher um, than it would have been had those projections in January occurred. So we're actually projected to be about 1089 at the end of this year. Uh, back in January, we're projecting to be about 1068. So we already have gotten a little bit of that water this year. Um, and then, but it also set up 2020 where um, we could see some. Uh, at least we won't see this lower release that we were concerned about, the 7.48 million acre foot release 
um, at least Powell will release at least 8.23 in 2020 with the potential to release even more if the hydrology is good enough. Question for uh, Dan Dem. Dem. Uh, you spoke about the uh, mitigation of water uh, balancing uh, the losses uh, from uh, USA related transfers between 2003 and uh, the end of 2017. Uh, yet the Salton City lost close to eight feet of level in those years. Uh, and other stories I've heard is that it was only supposed to keep the salinity increase on a particular track, but not sustain level. Can you explain exactly what that mitigation water balance really was? Well, I, I do believe that the mitigation water provided salinity and elevation impacts or um, mitigated for salinity and elevation impacts. Um, in terms of what are other factors that uh, contribute to the reduction in the shoreline? I think you, you don't have to look very f much further than inflows from the New and Alamo River. I think that contributes to a big portion of it. And I also have to, I think you also have to look at farming practices and how that's changing the valley. I think that um, going or, or the push to uh, more organic farming, and I think that certainly Tina can speak to this a lot better than I can, um, but that, that has uh, an impact as well. Um, and those are good things. Um, so there's a lot more to it than, than just uh, QSA transfers. So the mitigation measure was specifically to keep salinity at the same level. The transfers when we did the modeling exacerbated the salinity decline of that eight to 10 years. So volumetrically, they were calculated from a standpoint where elevation if everything would have been equal and all the different water balance components would have been the same, but you had drought, you had uh, reduced inflows from Mexico, you have variable agricultural practices, you have the fact that IID was capped at 3.1 in the past, our water use could have gone significantly higher in really strong ag markets. So um, the, the mitigation measure specifically was only for salinity. Um, I don't think it was exactly a one-to-one -one on an elevation perspective, given all of those other factors. Question for, this is for the panel there. Uh, who actually owns the water in the Salton Sea? Who is responsible for that water? Which agency? <laughs> I'm not going to say we own it, but I, I think Nobody's really asked that hard question because probably nobody wants to claim it. <laughs> and, and it is a variety of water sources. So there's surface water flows, there's subsurface seepage, the, the soils in the Kachala area are much sandier, so a lot of where groundwater is in surface is subsurface. There's groundwater interactions. Um, you know, that's probably a fight still to be had um, from different water agencies, or a fight not to be had. <laughs> San Diego doesn't own it. <laughs> I have a question for the panel. I'm more interested in alternative energy. And Elon Musk has created cars that run off of hydrogen, which is basically H2O split. I'm curious. Is anybody discussing the options of splitting the water to bring in and desalinate water? I've heard people talking about bringing water in off of like the San Clemente, San Onofre area to bring like, clean water into the aqueduct. And then that would alleviate some of the drain off of the Colorado River and the population explosion that we've had recently. So I'm just wondering if anybody's exploring hydrogen. Uh, you know, I, I can't speak to the hydrogen piece, but uh, water importation um, as a solution for the Salton Sea, um, specifically from the uh, Pacific Coast, um, I, I see that as a very difficult one. Um, you know, we, we are all talking, it seems like, these days about water imports from uh, Baja. I think the state is studying that. We plan to uh, spend about a million dollars on studying that a little bit further. Um, I, I think that um, getting some projects on the ground is a more important focus than any kind of water import system. And I'm going to mirror Dan's comments. I, I think those are great ideas. I mean, those are real solutions. 
but they're really costly measures and they're really big projects. And I mentioned that newspaper article 50 years ago today, they were talking about the same thing, and yet here we are and nothing's been done. The district's been really focused and has this little smaller but sustainable mantra. If we don't do something, none of that stuff's going to happen. So that's our near-term focus. The state has offered up a 10-year plan. We need to work with them. We need to advocate with them. We need to go after funding sources. Because if we don't get 10 years of projects, we'll have a whole lot of water supply problems in California because IG will be back at the state board saying folks aren't doing their end of the deal. Why should we do ours? But the solid sea it has it's at a point where it's collapsing and the air quality problems are going to really go crazy if we don't get a handle on it now. And we need to focus on getting a handle on it now. Yes. Well, I really reluctant to ask this question, but it's something I've wondered about since we've lived here um, at least 15 years. Um, I was aware immediately uh, and told that the water here is the cheapest in California. So, <laughs> why is it so cheap? Why could the prices, you know, go up with that? Help with the um, availability of water, at least on the private, you know, people who water their yards and things like that. I mean, is that anything viable or reasonable? Why is it so cheap? I think I <laughs> Okay. So IG's water is cheap. We have the luxury of having gravity flow. So we, we, as a water agency, charge for the cost of service. It's a delivery cost. It's not a water cost. So our charges are reflected on what those transportation costs are. So since we don't treat the water, since we don't have pumping costs, it is um, we are able to sell that water at a very low price. Um, we are able to use some of our transfer revenues to pay for some of our support services so we can keep that price low. Our board feels very strongly that as a result of these caps that our growers and our community has had in place, that we need to find a way to make and continue to make agriculture viable and to be as cost effective as we can for a community that isn't very affluent. Um, the, the financial obligations for the transfer are all lined out by contract. Um, IID did not ask for these transfers, and to the extent that the contracts were finally executed, it was because everybody came to an agreement on who was responsible for what. And the goal is to make sure everybody follows these contractual obligations. I have a question for Tina. Um, I noticed that under the crops growing in the underground. So the top crops are very thirsty crops like alfalfa. Is there any plans that maybe they could reduce those type of crops and have more sustainable crops in to have some water saving? So crop choices are grower choices. Um, it's not the Soviet Union. We don't tell folks where to plant. <laughs> and the markets drive their business decisions. So I think our farmers adapt to what you all purchase at the grocery store and um, what you eat and what the market conditions are. Um, I get all the time that, oh, you're growing rice in the desert or alfalfa. We can take this water and make computer chips. Those are decisions that are made by the communities and the water users. Um, and we don't tell them what to do. And if the markets don't dictate what they grow, they'll switch. Um, we are running very large scale uh, conservation programs and we're helping uh, provide funding to our growers to implement those. We're very limited in what we can do because we have these salt and sea issues right now. Um, but what you buy at the grocery store is dictating what folks grow. Tina, as a farmer, I can speak to a little bit of the alfalfa. Um, Unusual here, I'm probably the one in the audience. Alfalfa is a rotational crop with our produce. So if you like having a salad between Thanksgiving and Easter, you need alfalfa. Because the alfalfa is a three to four year crop. It is a nitrogen fixing legume. It repairs the soil profile, it helps bleach the soils. And then we go to a four or five year produce rotation. We cannot grow lettuce every winter, every year, without a rotational crop that helps you provide soil balance. So it's a requirement if you're less, you get it 
free from the phone as well. Okay, we have time for one more question. Considering the discussion regarding drought, um, conservative transfer policies, has anyone considered, well, which way the wind blows and the water cycle? Um, essentially, one atmospheric function that could be happening is a self-reinforcing anthropogenic loop, which tends to dehydrate the entire system, um, where ET is reduced to the point where the North American monsoon doesn't produce as much as the 30% of those summer rainfalls that you have talked about. Um, if you want to spend that million dollars, there are some PhDs from the Desert Research Institute that can do a mesoscale um, study on such things. What's the question? <laughs> the study would cost $100,000 and take 18 months. And I'll tell you where the rain comes from, where it falls. Okay, let's give this panel a good round.